It was around the year 1920, uh, a certain poor farmer and his family, they lived in the middle of nowhere, somewhere in the Midwest. One day the dad said, you know what? I've got to take care of some business in the big city. And so they got on onto their little buggy uh, pulled by their horse, old trusty uh, Rufus. And Rufus pulled their little buggy into town, the farmer, his wife, and his kids. Well, they get into the city and the kids are just ooing and aahing at all the huge buildings and the little automobiles coming by. They couldn't believe what they were seeing. And their dad pulled the horse and buggy there in front of a huge building. The thing was just larger than any building they'd ever seen. And he pulls in front of that building up to the, the curb and he turns to the back of the buggy and says to his youngest son, John, he says, Johnny, uh, you can come with me if you want. Everyone else uh, stay in the buggy. This won't take very long. And so Johnny jumps at the opportunity to go inside this big building. He goes in the front doors with his dad and they're looking at all the sites in the lobby. Dad goes up to the lady at the front desk, asks her where the certain office is that he needs to visit. She tells him it's on the fifth floor. So the farmer and little Johnny go over to the elevator and they stand there for five minutes in awe of these doors opening and closing, opening and closing. People co go in, the doors close and other people come out. Well, after a few minutes, the crowd died down and they noticed a little old lady that shuffled her way slowly to the elevator, waited for the doors to open, and she stepped inside, turned around in that elevator alone as the doors closed. It wasn't even 30 seconds later, those elevator doors opened back up and out stepped a beautiful young blonde woman. The dad and his son couldn't believe it. He says, wow, Johnny, quick, go to the buggy and bring your ma. Well, that farmer was a little shallow, wasn't he? The thought hadn't even crossed his mind <laughs> that maybe he should step into the elevator and be transformed for the benefit of his wife. He just wanted his wife to be transformed for the benefit of him. And I got to thinking about that. When we think about it, you and I aren't much different than that farmer. We really aren't because you see, we work much harder trying to get the people around us to change than we do trying to change ourselves. It's true, isn't it? Over the past six months here at Impact, we've been opening our Bibles to the book of Acts and we've been diving into God's word and seeing that uh, God was doing an amazing work in the man named Paul. We, we saw that, that the Apostle Paul was radically changed by God, radically changed. Over a period of about 30 years, Paul helped plant dozens of churches on two continents. He wrote half the books of the New Testament. And over the past 2,000 years, his New Testament writings have led hundreds of millions of people to his saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. To say that Paul was an important Christian would be an understatement. He went on to become hands down the most influential Christian in church history. The apostle Paul changed the world. Amazingly, he started out terribly. As a young adult, he was arresting Christians, persecuting Christians. He hated Jesus Christ, but God radically transformed him. You see, before Paul was able to change the world, before he was able to change the world, Jesus Christ had to first change him. And when he did change him, there was no turning back. Well, we're first introduced to Paul at the end of Acts chapter 7. That's why I asked you to turn there earlier. He's first mentioned there at the end of Acts chapter 7. You may remember what was happening at the time. Uh, Paul was going by his Jewish name, Saul. He was there in Jerusalem. You see, he had grown up in Jerusalem, that capital city uh, of Israel. And he was an apprentice to one of the most respected Jewish leaders of that day, the Jewish rabbi Gamaliel. All indications were that Saul himself was on track to become one of the most important leaders in all of Israel. In Acts chapter 7, one of the first deacons in the Christian church, a man by the name of Stephen, was being falsely accused of slandering the Jewish law and slandering the temple. And he was about to be stoned to death by an angry mob 
there in Jerusalem, this mob that had bought into these lies that had been told to them, hook, line, and sinker, about Stephen. Well, beginning in verse 57, we read these words. At this, the mob covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at Stephen, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. This is the very first time that Saul is mentioned in the Bible. According to Jewish law, when a criminal was stoned to death, uh, there had to be some witnesses to verify that he was guilty. There had to be at least two in case one guy was lying. But some of those Jewish leaders who did not like Stephen had basically bribed a couple false witnesses to accuse him of these things, slandering the temple and slandering the Jewish law. And so in those days, the law was if someone was found guilty and sentenced to stoning to death, the witnesses who had testified against him would have to be the first to throw the rocks at him. Because if you were lying, most people with any sort of conscience whatsoever would think twice about throwing the rocket ahead of a guy that they knew in their heart was innocent. And so these witnesses that had lied about Stephen had to be the first to throw rocks at Stephen when he was sentenced to die. And so we read here in these verses, particularly verse 57, that these witnesses that had lied about Stephen and had to pick up rocks and throw them at Stephen, they laid their clothes at the feet of this young man, named Saul. It's very clear Saul kept an eye on their coats. These men who falsely accused Stephen and after accusing him murdered him. And so Saul, without a doubt, was an accomplice to the murder of Stephen. And we read these words in in verse 1 of of chapter 8 of Acts. It says, and Saul was there giving approval to his death. Now listen to how a a few other Bible translations translate this first part of verse 1. According to the English Standard Version, and Saul approved of his execution. Look at how the Holman Christian Standard says it. Saul agreed with putting him to death. The Living Bible says it this way. Paul was in complete agreement with the killing of Stephen. And finally, the message paraphrases Uh, the words this way, Saul was right there congratulating the killers. So so let that just sink in for a moment. He was applauding the murderers, those that had lied about him under oath and those that threw rocks at his head to kill him. He was in full agreement. For the first time in the Bible that we read about Saul, this great apostle Paul He's an accomplice to the murder of a Christian. And you thought your past was pretty shady. Doesn't compare to the past of the Apostle Paul. Well, as we pick up partway through verse 1 of chapter 8, we read these words. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen, mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Now, listen to these alternate translations of verse 3. The ESV and the Holman Christian Standard say it this way, Paul was ravaging the church, the living Bible. Paul was like a wild man going everywhere to devastate believers. And after studying the original Greek and some of these different translations in English, Chuck Swindoll said it this way, Saul was borderline out of control. He was borderline out of control. The guy had lost it. He was so vengeful, so much hating Jesus and hating Christians that he wanted to exterminate them from the earth. He hated Christians with a passion because from the bottom of his heart, he truly did hate Jesus Christ. He hated Jesus so much that he was going to eradicate the name of Jesus, not only from the lips of every Christian in Jerusalem, 
but from the lips of every Christian around the world. No matter what his mentor Gamaliel or his parents or anyone else said, Saul was going to do everything within his power to exterminate every last Christian on earth. He would either force them to deny and blaspheme Jesus, or he would see to it that they rotted in prison. And if they wouldn't let up, he'd cover the streets with their blood. That's how much he hated Christians. But all that changed in Acts chapter 9 when Paul met Jesus Christ. Follow along with me in Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 8. We read, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a loud voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he couldn't see anything. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. And for three days, he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Paul was never the same again after that moment. We've seen that, those of you who have been a part of our church over the past six months, we've seen that as we've studied the life of Paul. He was never the same again. He had this amazing conversion, the light from heaven, Jesus Christ appearing to him, and he just couldn't wrap his mind around what was going on in that moment because everything that he had believed, everything that he stood for, everything that he was about to dedicate the rest of his life to seemed to be crashing down in just a moment. He was overwhelmed. Paul seems to have been in shock for three days. He couldn't believe how wrong he'd been, He fasted from all food and water, and his days and his nights were consumed with prayer and with reflection. Then a respected Christian leader named Ananias came to the house where Paul was staying, shared the good news of Jesus with him, prayed for him to receive back his sight, and baptized him most likely in a nearby river. And notice what it says beginning in verse 20 of Acts chapter 9. It says, At once... Saul began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? Hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. Powerful verses there, verses 20 through 22 in Acts 9. Pretty amazing, isn't it? The Jews couldn't believe their ears. The man who had been on a rampage against Christians was now claiming to be a Christian. The man who had come to Damascus to arrest and get rid of Christians was now trying to make more Christians. The Jews in Damascus were blown away by the transformation by the change they saw in Paul. Well, Paul made a big impact in the city of Damascus, but 10 years later, he made an even bigger impact in the city of Antioch of Syria. We read about that over in Acts chapter 13, beginning in verse two, if you'd like to turn there with me, Acts chapter 13, beginning in verse two, we read, while they were worshiping the Lord there in Antioch and fasting, The Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. That was the beginning of Paul's very first missionary journey, his first of three. And over the next 10 to 11 years, Paul went out onto the mission field, three missionary trips where he reached into Northwest Asia and Southeast Europe. And he did amazing work 
for the kingdom of God over those 10 to 11 years. Now, on that first of the three missionary trips, uh, Paul, by our standards, took a, a rather long trip. This was about a 1,400-mile journey. He started off there in Antioch of Syria. He and his missionary partner at the time, Barnabas, sailed to Barnabas's neck of the woods. Barnabas had been born and raised here on the island of Cyprus. So that's their first stop where they went on that first missionary journey. They spread the gospel of Jesus Christ there in key cities on the island of Cyprus. From there, they went to the mainland, modern day Turkey, and they crossed the mountain range into the area of Galatia. And there in that region of Galatia, they visited and planted churches in four key cities, Pisidian Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. And you may remember that uh, when he went to those four cities in Galatia, things didn't go so well. In that first city, Pisidian Antioch, he was basically given a cease and desist order. Paul and Barnabas were told in no uncertain terms, you got to shut up about Jesus or we're going to kick you out of town. So they were in all essence, for all intents and purposes, kicked out of town in Pisidian Antioch. So they went to the second town, I Iconium, and things were going well in Iconium for a while. But after a little while, uh, some people came against him, particularly the Jewish people that didn't like Jesus at all. And they had this plot afoot to kill both Paul and Barnabas. So when Paul caught wind of it, they took off from Iconium, went to the third city, the city of Lystra. And you may remember there in Lystra, after a few weeks, Paul was in fact stoned by a mob. They stoned him. They thought he was dead. He was unconscious. They dragged his lifeless body and dumped it in the dirt outside of town. Well, Paul regained consciousness, stood up, brushed the dust off his, his clothes, and went right back into that city of Lystra to keep ministering to the church. And then he went to the city of Derby. And so that was their first missionary journey. They visited those four cities in Galatia. After visiting Derby, they went back to those other three cities and then back to Antioch. It was about a, a two year journey and about a 1400 mile trip. We read a chapter or two later that Paul uh, then went on his second missionary journey. His second missionary journey, you can see from the map, was much longer. He didn't just travel 1,400 miles. He doubled that distance. He traveled around 2,800 miles. This time, he didn't just go to Cyprus and Galatia. He stretched far into Europe. Well, it was not far into Europe, but far for him. He was here in this southeast uh, corner of Europe in the country of Greece. And so here he went back to those churches he had planted on his first missionary journey. This time he wasn't with Barnabas, he was with Silas. And, and he wanted to go over to Ephesus, but the Holy Spirit said, no, it's not time. And so he went northwest into Troas where he picked up Dr. Luke, who would join him from that point forward on his missionary journeys. Luke went on to write the book of Acts. And from Troas, remember, he went to four key cities, or actually five key cities in Greece, Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea in the north, and in the southern area, uh, sometimes called Achaia. He went to Athens and Corinth. He spent a year and a half in Corinth. And so on this second missionary journey, uh, Paul traveled 2,800 miles, and he was on the mission field on this second journey for the better part of three years. And so you find as these missionary journeys went along, oftentimes he covered more distance and he stayed longer. Finally, he got to his third missionary journey, very similar with his, uh, to his second journey. He went back once again, strengthened the churches there in Galatia, and the Holy Spirit gave him the thumbs up to this time head west into that city of Ephesus. Paul had dreamed about this for several years because he knew if he was able to reach Ephesus, the capital city in that region of the province of Asia, he could likely reach all the other cities there in the province of Asia. And that's exactly what happened. Paul was in Ephesus for three years, the longest he stayed at any of the churches he planted. And during that three years, the gospel was taken throughout that Asia Minor area, throughout the province of Asia, and likely thousands of people heard the gospel of Jesus Christ because Paul had been in Ephesus. From Ephesus, he went back to Troas and the other cities uh, there in Greece to strengthen those churches he had planted on his second missionary journey. And finally, at the end of the third journey, he went to Jerusalem, where as we saw over the last couple of weeks, he was eventually arrested and would be led to Rome, where he would continue to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, Paul spent those 10 to 11 years on the mission field during those three missionary journeys doing amazing work. 
Scholars estimate that over the course of his ministry years, particularly those three missionary journeys, he traveled upward of 10,000 miles. Several thousand of those miles were on foot when he traveled. Uh, he wrote probably almost half of his 13 New Testament books uh, during the time of those 10 to 11 years on the mission field. Paul was a busy guy, and he was a very productive kind of busy. God worked through him in a powerful way to change the world. Amen? Amen. Well, I want to share with you five life lessons that I think the Lord wants for us today. I went back through the messages that I've preached over the last six months, looking at those key lessons, and I pulled out 22 life lessons that I thought would be good to share with you today. I knew I didn't have time for 22, so I've whittled it down to five. So these are five of the most important lessons I believe God has for us today. Some of you have heard these before. They're brand new to others of you, but all of us need to hear them again. Life lesson number one, even the greatest Christians have checkered paths. So no matter what you've done, no matter how far you've strayed from God, there is hope for you in Christ. Amen. If you'll let him, God will forgive you. Let me say that again. If you'll let him, God will forgive you. Most of you have heard me say it before, and I hope it rings like a broken record in your ears. God's grace is greater than your disgrace. Amen? God's grace is greater than your disgrace. Say that with me. God's grace is greater than your disgrace. Well, don't forget the most loved Christian song of the past 200 years, Amazing Grace, was written by a former slave ship captain. Yep, John Newton, as you may remember, in the early 1800s, he was going to Africa with his ship and he was forcing Africans against their will, kidnapping them, forcing them into the hull of his ship and trading them and selling them in the slave trade in England. That's probably one of the most reprehensible things any human being could ever do. Kidnap another human being, shove them into a hole of a ship, and force them to be slaves for the rest of their lives. It's just one of the most heinous things any person could ever do. But he gave his life to Christ, and Jesus Christ forgave even him. And later in life, he penned those now famous words, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. And I've thought many times if God can cover the sin of a man like John Newton after what he did, he can certainly cover my sin and he can certainly cover your sin. It's true. No matter what you've done, no matter how far you've strayed from God, there is hope for you in Christ. If you'll let him, God will forgive you. God will save you. Believe that today. Life lesson number two. God doesn't just save hell-bent sinners. He recruits them to change the world. I love this lesson. I can't over overemphasize how important it is for you to understand and to believe this life lesson. Believe it for yourself and believe it for those around you. Even after you're saved, Satan is very good at whispering in your ear, you're nobody. You don't belong at church. You don't fit in. You've got nothing to offer. You can't lead anyone to Christ. You're useless. And that's when Jesus Christ calls you to stand up and say, get behind me, Satan. Go to hell where you belong because you're speaking lies to me right now and I don't need to hear them. You see, I used to be a loser, but Jesus Christ has made me a winner. I used to be a nobody, but Jesus has made me into a, into a somebody. I used to be a reject, but now I've got a church family that loves me. I can lead my friends and family to Jesus Christ. I can do great things for Jesus Christ, not because I'm great, but because he's great living inside of me. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Amen? Now listen to this. This life lesson goes far beyond applying it to yourself. I want you to apply it to yourself, 
But don't miss this. It also applies to those around you who have rejected God. It applies to your son or daughter who told you a few months back, I don't believe in God anymore. It applies to your brother and sister who haven't gone to church in 10 years. It applies to your niece or nephew who are strung out on drugs out on the street somewhere. It applies to your uncle in prison. It applies to the most wicked woman you've ever met. It applies to the most crooked politician you've ever known. Christians, don't stop praying for those around you who are the least likely people on the planet to ever get saved or do something extraordinary for God. In His amazing grace, God loves choosing the worst of sinners to do some of His greatest work. It's true. God did it 2,000 years ago with a Jesus-hating murderer named Saul, and He still does it today. Which leads us to life lesson number three. Jesus Christ is full of surprises. You know that, don't you? (laughs) He's full of surprises. So don't get too comfortable where you are, physically, emotionally, spiritually, or even geographically. God has a way of shaking up your plans to stretch you and move you into deeper levels of trust and obedience. In our first year of marriage, Christine and I never would have imagined or dreamed that we would be spending the next 23 years of our lives in the high desert of all places. Wasn't even on our radar, never really crossed our minds. It was was just something that broadsided us when this opportunity arose and God said, I'm opening the door. I want you, Dane and Christine, to walk through it. It's amazing what God does. He's got all sorts of plans to shake up our intentions and dreams and goals. I want to ask you, do you believe in God? Sure you do, right? You believe in God. Now let me ask you a little bit harder question. Do you really trust God? Do you trust God? Do you really trust that his thoughts are higher than your thoughts? Do you really trust that his ways are are better than your ways? Do you really deep down trust that God's plans for your life are so much better than your plans for your life? Do you trust God more than you trust yourself? As uncomfortable and unnerving as it is at times, don't resist what God is doing in your life. Give God permission to make you uncomfortable and shake up your plans. He doesn't waste pain in your life, and he certainly doesn't waste change. He is stretching you and moving you into deeper levels of trust and obedience. So go with it. Trust it. Leads us to life lesson number four. If you want to be a deep Christian, you need to be a churched Christian. Just like Barnabas and Saul, we are much better and stronger together. So don't be a lone ranger Christian. In Acts chapter 9, we discover that after Saul's conversion, he connected with the church in Damascus immediately. And that was his MO for the next 25 years. When he arrived in a city, he would quickly connect with a Christian church in that city. And if there wasn't a Christian church in that city, he would create one. He would build a brand new church in that city. He started churches left and right when he didn't find a church in a city. Paul needed the church every bit as much as the church needed Paul. And the same is true of you. You need the church every bit as much as the church needs you. We need each other. Don't just receive from the church. Make sure you give to the church because once again, you have something important to contribute God has wired you to do something special and important in the church that you can do better than others that God might use if you choose not to get involved. God needs you. The church needs you. And you need the church. You need fellowship with other Christians. You need worship. You need study with other Christians, the studying of God's word. You need to be available to take communion with other Christians. It's so important. One of the most helpful and loving things that you and I can ever do is to be together with other Christians 
to help sharpen them in their faith, to worship with them, to take communion with them, uh, to study God's word with them, and to use our gifts to minister to them. But you know what? Something else that's true. One of the most loving and compassionate and caring things you could ever do for another Christian is simply help them get plugged into a good Bible teaching church. It's a wonderful thing. It's one of the reasons we celebrate this Back to Church Sunday every year. We want you who are followers of Christ and a part of this church to have the opportunity to share it easily with others. Because there are so many millions of Christians in our country that over the last two and a half years have stopped going to church in person and stopped going to church even online. And God has given us the opportunity to do something very loving for those Christians who aren't plugged in anywhere, to invite them to church and help bring them back into fellowship. It's one of the most wonderful gifts we could ever give another Christian. Make sure that you're sharing Christ with others and sharing church with other Christians. Lesson number five, you have precious little time to impact the lives around you. So hit the ground serving, finish strong. Far too many Christians start strong and finish weak. Well, regardless of how badly you started your Christian journey, take comfort from the apostle Paul. You think you started bad? He started even worse. He began his early adult years by chasing down Christians, yanking them out of their houses, going into synagogues, yanking the Christians out of the synagogues, arresting them, falsely accusing them, throwing them in prison, and at times even voting to have them killed. That's how Paul started his ministry years as an adult. Your start certainly wasn't as bad as his. Paul didn't start his adult years very well but he sure did finish well. Once he made up his mind to give Jesus Christ everything he had, he fought the good fight and he finished the race and he finished strong and so can you. You have one week less on this earth than you had last Sunday. So there's really no time to lose. If you're serious about living for Jesus, give him your all. There's no turning back. Finish strong. Finish strong. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And we thank you for the privilege of studying your word today. Lord, for some of us, this was a bit of a review. For the others of us, Lord, we learned things about Paul we'd never learned before. But Lord, for all of us, you've given these powerful, changing less, life-changing lessons. Lord, I pray that we would take them to heart that we would remember them, O God. Help us, O God, to carry these out. Lord, help us to understand, even though we have checkered paths, even though we've strayed from you, there is hope for us in Christ. You can forgive us, no matter what we've done. Thank you for that second lesson, Lord, that you don't just save hell-bent sinners. You recruit hell-bent sinners to change the world. Thank you, Lord, for this third lesson that you're full of surprises and you mess up our plans. But when you mess up our plans, your plans are so much better than our plans that we thought weren't messed up. Help us to trust you and let you increase our trust and obedience. Lord, thank you for this fourth lesson, that if we want to be deep Christians, you've provided the church to help us dig deeper in the word and draw closer to you and be the Christians you've called us to be. Help us, Lord, not to put church any longer on the back burner, but to be deep Christians by being churched Christians. And finally, Lord, this fifth lesson, thank you for this time you've given us. We realize we have precious little time left, but thank you for the time you've given us that we can finish strong. Lord, help us not to focus on the past and our failures. Help us to stay focused on the goal ahead to finish this race you have for us. Help us, Lord, to finish strong for the glory of God and the advancement of the kingdom of Jesus Christ on earth. And all God's people said, amen, amen. We never like a service here at Impact to end without giving you an opportunity to make a decision for Jesus Christ if you've never put him in the driver's seat of your life. If you realize that you cannot make it to heaven on your own good works or your own religious acts, if you realize your only hope is Jesus Christ, 
Let me just quickly share with you the ABCs of becoming a follower of Jesus. A, admit that you were a sinner and that you need Jesus Christ. B, believe Jesus died on the cross for your sins and he's your only hope of heaven. And C, choose to begin following him today. Choose to put him in the driver's seat of your life and have him call the shots for this from this point forward. If you're ready to put him in the driver's seat, please reach out to us at Impact. You can call us by phone at 760-246-4100. Leave us a message and we'll get back to you real soon. Or you could simply send us an email at info at greaterimpact.cc. If you need prayer or if you've made a decision for Christ, let us know. And if you've made that decision for Christ, your next step, you need to be baptized. Every Christian in the New Testament that accepted Christ was baptized as soon as possible to make it clear they were following Jesus Christ. If you need to be baptized, let us know. If need be, we can even bring the baptistry to you. That's why we have a portable one. Let us know if we can help you in any way. Well, we were so glad that you joined us here at Impact for our Back to Church Sunday service. There's one thing left in the service. That's our communion time together. Uh, if you're going to stay for communion, make sure you have your bread and juice ready. Uh, if you don't have that ready and want to pass on communion today, uh, let me just take this opportunity to once again say thank you so much for joining us in worship. May God bless you as you trust Jesus Christ, as you love Jesus Christ, and as you walk in obedience to his commands. Tell a friend, tell a family member about Impact. Bring them back with you next week. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday. God bless.